Hello, my name is Matt Landers. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the Public Policy and Government Relations Director at GSBA, Washington State's LGBTQ and Allied Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a member of the Washington State LGBTQ Commission, and I'm a registered lobbyist at the State of Washington. So today, I want to take a look at some of the LGBTQ-related bills uh, that came up in the 2020 Washington State Legislative Session. In Washington, we have a part-time legislature that meets for 105 days in the odd numbers years to write the budget, and then 60 days in the even numbered years. So in 2020, the legislator met for the short session just from January to March. For the last few years, we have had strong pro-LGBTQ majorities in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and of course, a strong ally in the governor's office as well. Washington also benefits from having the largest LGBTQ state legislative caucus in the United States with four out senators and five out representatives in Olympia, including this year for the first time, Washington State's first female Speaker of the House and out lesbian Lori Jenkins from Tacoma. Uh, it's also important to note that the COVID-19 pandemic was declared uh, in the last few days of the legislative session and then instantly changed uh, the tone of the year. Uh, in anticipation of huge budget shortfalls, uh, Governor Inslee had to veto over $235 million in new spending that had been allocated by the legislature just weeks before. So we had a lot of progress, but unfortunately some of it has had to be put on hold due to the economic crisis around the pandemic. Uh, we are likely to see a special session later this year, uh, perhaps in the fall, uh, before we enter into next year's long session after the election. But so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna take you through some of the bills focusing on LGBTQ issues that were in the legislature this year. And so I'll start with, with the worst bill. Uh, the transgender sports ban would have prevented trans girls or anyone else assigned male at birth from participating in girls' sports in public athletics. Interestingly, the proponents of this bill never addressed trans boys playing in boys' sports, but there you have it. Uh, thankfully, this bill never got a hearing in committee. Uh, that's one of the benefits to having pro-equality majorities and to having a Speaker of the House uh, from our community. Uh, Speaker Jenkins refused to let this issue even be debated in the legislature, and so it never saw the light of day. That is a big success in Washington just a few years after we had to fight off uh, initiatives 1515 and 1552. However, unfortunately, a similar bill was passed in our neighbor, uh, Idaho, as part of a coordinated campaign by anti-LGBTQ forces. Uh, luckily though, our dear friends at the ACLU and Legal Voice are challenging it, and we hope that it will be quickly stricken from the books. In happier news, Washington State established the nation's very first state-level Office of Equity, championed by Representative Mia Gregerson of SeaTac. This office would coordinate efforts across state agencies and departments to reduce systemic inequities, uh, recommend best practices, and provide assistance for implementation and training. So it's gonna take all the work that the agencies and departments are doing and making sure it's being done right. Uh, it requires that an, uh, all state agencies apply an equity lens to their existing and proposed policies, how they deliver their services, their programs, uh, their practices, and I think really importantly, their budget decisions. Uh, these efforts are explicitly to lessen disparities in historically and currently marginalized populations, including race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity and expression, and sexual orientation. Uh, so again, this news was very exciting. However, as I mentioned before, due to the pandemic, um, the governor had to take some budget cuts and that meant that the Office of Equity, while it's been created, Unfortunately, all funding was, um, was vetoed by the governor at the moment. So it should be a priority for our community in the coming years to reallocate those funds for the office so that Washington can make some significant progress in meeting many of the goals that um, so many of us have been talking about uh, in the last several weeks. The HIV modernization bill, 1551, was the latest attempt to modernize how our laws treat HIV and AIDS. Uh, our original bill um, was passed at the very start of the HIV 
uh, pandemic. Um, and it really hasn't been updated since then. So it's pretty outdated. It doesn't reflect the current understandings of the disease and how you treat it. Um, this bill is really complicated and really detailed. And while the community didn't get everything we wanted in it, such as the full decriminalization of HIV, um, it does mark some significant progress. So this bill does reduce HIV related stigma and health disparities. It improves access to STD testing, STD care, uh, HIV prevention services. It does modernize the HIV criminal law to reflect modern science and treatment of the disease. Um, and some, some exceptional um, practices that were only applied to HIV and AIDS. Um, and then it did downgrade criminal transmission of HIV from a felony to a misdemeanor. And again, the community is hoping for this to be completely decriminalized, but um, this is still some progress in the process. So if you need more information about the changes in this bill, you should contact the fantastic organizations who've been at the heart of this work, uh, including Lifelong, Gay City, Pierce, K Pierce County AIDS Foundation and Blue Mountain Heart to Heart. They've really been central to this um, and they can go over all the details if you need more information. So Washington's 2010 mental health parity law means that all insurers must cover medically necessary mental health services if they also cover medical and surgical services and that that coverage must be delivered under the same terms and conditions. And so while this is a great law, it was originally passed with a few loopholes that meant that trans people often had difficulty receiving similar mental health coverage um, when cisgender people could receive it in similar situations. So sponsored by Representative Nicole Macri of Seattle, this bill closes those loopholes and reiterates that the protections of the Washington law against discrimination for gender identity and sexual orientation apply to all state regulated health plans. And then championed by our first queer senator, Emily Randall of Gate Harbor, the LGBTQ Veterans Coordinator is a brand new position within the Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs and will focus kind of logically on outreach to the LGBTQ veterans, their spouses and their dependents. Uh, this will help with many vets who are discharged under previous military policies like Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, for being LGBTQ. Uh, this coordinator can help those vets upgrade the character of their discharge from service. Uh, and additionally, with the Trump administration's current attacks against trans service members, the coordinator will be able to assist them in receiving the benefits and the support that they are due. Our first lesbian senator, Clara Wilson of Federal Way, uh, has led the efforts for this important sex ed bill for the last two years. And it's been fairly controversial in Olympia uh, but it did pass uh, in 2020. It requires every public school to provide comprehensive sexual education, and that education must be evidence-informed, medically and scientifically accurate, age-appropriate, and inclusive for all students, including LGBTQ students. Uh, and I think that reflects a lot of the experiences that many of us in the LGBTQ community have had, where any sex education that we received in schools, if we received it at all, uh, certainly didn't speak to, to our lives or experiences. Uh, it teaches younger students about what kind of touching is inappropriate by peers or predators. It helps older students resist abusive behavior and understand affirmative consent. Uh, at all times, parents are allowed to uh, have their children opt out of the, the, this education. Um, but still, uh, unfortunately, um, Bill 5395 was successfully challenged by a referendum, and so it will be appearing on the November ballot for a vote by the people. Uh, that will be, I believe, referendum 90. And I highly encourage everyone to look into the campaign to vote yes to approve this law to ensure that Senate Bill 5395 on sex education actually becomes law, finally. So I'm gonna end with one of the most important bills of the 2020 session, and also one with a sad background. The LGBTQ panic defense is a legal strategy that asks a jury to find that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity or expression is to blame for the defendant's violent reaction, including murder. 
When a perpetrator uses a panic defense, they are claiming that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity not only explains, but excuses a loss of self-control and the subsequent assault. By fully or partially acquitting the perpetrators of crimes against LGBTQ victims, uh, this defense implies that our lives are worth less than others. Uh, this awful defense has been used as an excuse in the trials uh, of the murders of Larry King, Gwen Araujo, Angie Zapata, and Islam Nettles, among too many others. This bill removes the ability for a defendant to claim diminished capacity based on learning about a victim's actual or perceived gender identity or sexual orientation. And so, as you can see there, this bill was named the Nikki Kuhnhausen Act in memory of a young trans woman uh, murdered in Vancouver, Washington late last year. Um, and the, the man who, who murdered her has said that he was put into a rage when he learned uh, that she was trans. And so he then felt he had to kill her or he lost control. And so Nikki's family was able to testify um, in memory of their daughter um, alongside many members of the trans community who have been disproportionately impacted uh, by violence and by uh, these kinds of excuses. Um, about the tremendous harm that these defenses do to the LGBTQ community by remaining an option. One of the issues we had after bringing this up in 2019 for the first time was that some legislators thought that this wasn't an issue in Washington state, that it, hadn't, it wasn't being used very often, so why did we need a law? Um, and unfortunately, Nikki Kuhnhausen's um, tragic murder really proved that this defense is still used, that its existence is deeply harmful and traumatic to our communities, um, horribly offensive and incredibly demeaning. And so as the community talked with legislators, uh, they realized the importance of passing this bill. It was one of the very first to pass the legislature this year. And so Governor Inslee did sign the bill, um, uh, one of the first he signed this year, uh, with Nikki Kuhnhausen's family by his side and many community advocates, uh, making Washington state the 10th state to outlaw these panic defenses. So what more needs to be done? We've had a great few years with pro-LGBTQ majorities in the legislature, but our work is not yet done. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we need to fund the Office of Equity to ensure that the hard work that is needed to fix structural inequities is actually done in Washington state. We need to ensure that conversations around community equity do not leave out the LGBTQ community, and especially our LGBTQ Black, Indigenous, and people of color, uh, transgender, non-binary folk, disabled LGBTQ people, and everyone living intersectional identities. That means they've not had equal access and opportunities. We need to keep encouraging the Washington Healthcare Authority to fully implement inclusive healthcare for trans and non-binary folks in Washington state. The Coalition for Inclusive Healthcare has been working on this cause for years, and despite a lot of hurdles and roadblocks from the agency, uh, we are hopeful that there will be some major progress soon. We need to continue to fight for the full decriminalization and destigmatization of HIV and AIDS, uh, we need to ensure that our good anti-discrimination laws actually mean something on the ground for the experiences of LGBTQ people. We know that the U.S. Civil Rights Act of 1964 did not end anti-Black prejudice in the United States, and neither did the 2006 Washington Law Against Discrimination end prejudice against LGBTQ people. So we need to be constantly vigilant that our state, our institutions, and our society are being held accountable to the laws that we worked so hard to pass. So what can you do? Stay involved, pay attention, know what your legislators, your city councils, your county councils are doing. Uh, write to your legislators often. They want to hear from you. They want to hear from their constituents more than they want to hear from lobbyists like me. Follow and support the many organizations who are doing this work every day on the issues you care about. Um, and then I highly encourage you to come in person and learn how to lobby in Olympia. It's really easy. Uh, Equal Rights Washington 
uh, holds an annual LGBTQ Lobby Day. I've attended it for several years, brought friends, brought colleagues. It's a great time to set you up with uh, breakfast and lunch, uh, let you talk with lobbyists. You, they set you up with legislators. Uh, it's very easy and it makes a huge difference to show up uh, in community in Olympia. So thank you for joining me today to learn a little bit more about the 2020 Washington State Legislative Session. Uh, and as I'm signing off and as you celebrate Pride, just remember that the origins of our community's rights are rooted in protests led by queer and trans people of color. So celebrate our progress, but keep fighting for the change we have not yet achieved. Thank you very much.